Soul Questions. Should you pee in a pool? When you gotta go, you gotta go. And sometimes you gotta go on a hot summer day while floating neck deep in the middle of a pool. It might be tempting to just pee right there in the water, but you really, really shouldn't. That's because it's not quite as harmless as it seems. Here's why. Experts say that the average residential backyard swimming pool has about two gallons of pee in it at any given time. Luckily, that's only one hundredth of one percent. But even still, a little pee in a pool can go a long way. You see, pool water is treated with a chemical called chlorine, which helps kill bacteria and keep the water nice and clean so that people don't get sick from swimming in it. It's also what gives pool water that nice aquamarine color. The problem is, chlorine doesn't react well to things like dirt, sweat, body oils, and most of all, pee. When chlorinated water combines with urine, it creates a compound that stays in the water. According to the American Chemical Society, both red eyes and pool smell that we all know and don't really like are a result of, well, you guessed it, leftover pee molecules in the pool water. So if you've really gotta go, just be sanitary and go pee in the ocean. Oh, and you might have heard about some special compounds they put in pools that reveal urine and can catch someone in the act of peeing? Yeah, it turns out that's a myth. Nothing like that really exists. So if you pee in the pool, no one's gonna know unless they feel that awful warm spot. What causes some people to go bald and not others? Lots of people lose their hair. By 35, Two-thirds of American men have started to lose some hair, even if they don't notice it yet. By 50, about 85% either have thinning hair or are completely bald. And it's not just men, but women and children too. 80% of women over 60 have some amount of hair loss, however small. Even about 3% of kids experience some amount of hair loss. So in other words, hair loss, also known as alopecia, is very common especially for guys. More often than not, going bald is caused by your genetics, meaning it's passed down from your parents or grandparents. Everyone sheds between 50 and 100 hairs per day. I'm sure you've noticed them in your pillow and clogging up your shower drain. Losing hairs daily is no big deal because your body produces new hair to take its place, keeping your hair thick. But for those with alopecia, that doesn't happen. Your body stops producing the right cells needed to produce new hairs. Kids rarely have alopecia, but instead can develop thinning hair or bald spots in all sorts of other ways. Anything from brushing hair too hard, to over-treating it with chemicals, to wearing overly tight ponytails can lead to hair loss for kids. Today, there are all sorts of products and procedures for people who want to try and slow or stop their hair loss. But when it comes to genetics, the reality is, there might not be anything you can do. Why adults stop growing? The main reason we stop growing is because our DNA tells us to. Let me explain. Every person starts as one single cell. That cell splits and splits and splits millions of times more. And before you know it, that cluster of cells is a complex structure. When you're born, you continue to grow and develop quickly until the end of puberty, when your DNA finally tells your body to stop growing. Once you finally leave puberty, your body starts producing lots of estrogen, which is a hormone that basically fuses shut the receptors in your bones that cause growth. So that's how your body stops growing, but why? Well, scientists aren't positive, but they do have some theories. You see, it's actually a disadvantage to be too tall. It puts a lot of stress on your bones and muscles, which can lead to arthritis and trouble moving. It also makes it much harder on your organs, because your heart needs to pump much harder to get blood all around such a big body. So would it be fun to just keep growing until we were all giants? Well, sure, but just be glad we don't get so tall that it's hard to live. Have you ever stopped and wondered just how old a person can get? It's not all that uncommon for healthy people to live to be 100 years old. In fact, 
There's almost 500,000 people across the world right now who are centenarians, which is a fancy word for someone over 100 years old. The United States has the highest number of centenarians living today, around 72,000. Japan is the second to the US with around 30,000 people over 100. Nowadays, people are living longer and longer. And if that continues at its current rate, there will be almost a million people in the United States alone over 100 years old by 2050. Right now, about one in every 1,000 centenarians live long enough to become super centenarians. At 110 years or older, the rarest feat of life is someone who lives to be 115. As of today, there's only 47 people in recorded history who can confirm they lived that long. As of early 2019, the oldest living person on Earth is a Japanese woman by the name of Kane Tanaka at 116 years young. Okay, so now you know how old people can live, but what can we do to try and live longer? Well, some experts have actually found special spots all around the globe where an unusually high number of people live extra long. These regions are called blue zones, and there's thought to be five of them on Earth. Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Ikaria, Greece, and Loma Linda, California in the US. The theory goes that people living in these five blue zones often live much longer and healthier lives because of a few key things they all have in common. They all tend to smoke less, eat mostly plants, very little meat, and most importantly, legumes like beans. On top of their clean diet, these five regions tend to put a huge emphasis on family, staying physically active every day, and most importantly, they have strong communities where people interact with their neighbors and help each other out. So, how do we stay young as we grow old? Well, if these blue zones tell us anything about living longer, the keys are everyday exercise, a nice healthy diet, and lots of people to love. What causes our eyes to be different colors? The color of your eyes has to do with the amount of melanin you have in your iris. Melanin is a pigment, or natural coloring, found in animal tissue. It gives our skin and hair their color, and our eyes are no different. Having less pigment gives you blue eyes. Having a little bit more will make your eyes green, and if you have lots of pigment, it leads to brown eyes. You or someone you know might have different eye colors or patches within one eye. For instance, Blue eyes with green around the edges or green eyes with brown around the irises are common. When this happens, it's because different areas within the actual eye make different amounts of melanin, changing the colors. What color eyes you end up with is genetic, meaning it's passed down from your parents even if you don't share the same eye color. Science is still trying to understand exactly what genes in our eyes get passed down to determine our eye color. So far, the key gene in brown eyes has been discovered, but experts have had no luck so far uncovering the gene for green eyes. Okay, so that's why people have different colored eyes, but one question remains. What about the one in every 100 Americans who have two different colored eyes? Just about every baby is born with gray eyes, but in the first several months after you're born, the color in the irises develops, giving you your eye color. The melanin levels in a baby's eyes determine how dark their eyes become. However, for those 1 in 100, the amount of melanin in each eye isn't uniform. This is called heterochromia. Complete heterochromia happens when each eye is one distinct color. Central heterochromia, on the other hand, is when your eyes have multiple colors mixed across the two. But don't worry, not only is heterochromia a completely harmless condition, but it can look kind of cool, too. What causes some people to have straight hair and others to have curly? It turns out that whether you have super straight hair or a bunch of tight curls, you can thank your genes. But how exactly? Experts are still trying to determine exactly how our genes work to make our hair look a certain way. But studies have shown that your DNA is definitely a huge factor. Let's start with the basics. Every hair on your body grows out of its own hair follicle, 
which are tiny little organs just below the surface of your skin. Cells inside the follicle divide and multiply, slowly pushing upwards and hardening along the way. By the time the hardening cells get long enough to poke out of your skin, they've hardened into a hair. How curly a single strand of human hair gets depends on the hair follicle it's growing out of. If a follicle isn't quite symmetrical, it produces a strand of hair in a slightly oval shape, which tends to naturally curl the longer it gets. If a follicle is symmetrical, the hair it makes will come out round and stay straight no matter how long it gets. And the shape of your hair follicles, it turns out, are determined by the genes you inherit from your parents. Usually, Curly hair is a bit more dry than straight hair because oils from your scalp have an easier time traveling down a straight strand of hair. But this also means that straight and wavy hair have a tendency to get a lot greasier than curly hair because of all that oil. So no matter what kind of hair you have, straight and oily or curly and dry, you only have your family to thank for it. What causes us all to be such different sizes? For the most part, how tall any of us will be mostly comes down to genetics, mixed in with your diet, health, and environment as a kid. According to experts, somewhere between 60 to 80% of our height is decided by our genes. You get all your genes from your parents, about half from each one of them. So if you have super tall parents, you're more likely to be tall yourself. And same if your parents are short. Experts say that the mix of genes that make up your height is complex. So gauging how tall you'll be based on your mom and dad is a decent indicator, but it's also a bit of an inexact science. That leaves just 20 to 40% of your height that's influenced by environmental effects, like how well you eat, your sleeping habits, exercise, and things like that. That means eating plenty of healthy foods and getting a good night's sleep isn't just something your mom nags about. It actually helps you grow taller and stronger as you grow up. Okay, so that's how people end up either tall or short, but why? Why are some people genetically tall or short? To answer that, we have to travel back, way back, way back to our ancient ancestors living in Africa almost two million years ago. They were genetically quite tall with thin bodies and long legs to help keep cool while traveling long distances in the sun. But as people made their way closer and closer to the frigid polar regions, they evolved to be a bit shorter and stockier to help conserve heat and keep warm in the cold winter months. Nowadays, kids grow about two inches or so per year from age three until they hit puberty. That's when the growth spurts start, where you might grow up to four inches a year, double the speed. So if you're not quite tall enough to ride the craziest coaster at the park, maybe just eat well and hope for puberty to hit. Just careful what you wish for. When did we start shaking hands? It probably seems like people have been shaking hands to say hello forever, and in some ways they have. Archaeologists have uncovered depictions of handshakes on vases, graves, stone slabs, statues, paintings, and all sorts of ancient art. But that classic greeting wasn't used in quite the same way we use it today. You see, for most of history, the handshake was mainly used to seal a pact or swear an oath rather than as a casual greeting. Some believe it could have started as a sign of peace between enemies or rivals. After all, clasping someone's hand or wrist is a half-decent way to prove that you aren't carrying some kind of a concealed weapon up your sleeve. According to experts, it wasn't until the mid-1800s that people actually started shaking hands to say hello. And even back then, it was considered a little too casual a greeting, meant just for close, casual friends, kind of like the 19th century equivalent of a fist bump. So if the handshake we know and love today was finally a fairly common greeting by the 1800s, then who actually started shaking hands to say hello? Well, no one can say for sure, but the Quakers are often given credit. 
Quakers were a religious group who left Britain for America in the 1600s, believing the Church of England had become too materialistic for its own good. Back in England, a bow, curtsy, salute, and all other forms of saying hello were common and expected when greeting a powerful person. The Quakers believed that everyone was equal and decided they needed a new greeting that anyone could use regardless of their wealth or influence. Scientists can't say for sure exactly why the handshake stuck around, but there is one theory that it might have something to do with smell. You see, a handshake may actually be a way for us to reflexively sniff for subtle smells on other people, since it forces you to touch and get near each other. Think of it a bit like dogs sniffing each other when they first meet. Every person gives off chemical signals in the form of smells that others detect and helps us communicate basic subconscious info without even talking. Or in other words, we like to sniff people out when we first meet them, literally. So next time you meet someone new and you have an almost automatic urge to reach out and shake their hand to greet them, just remember, you might be sniffing them and they might be sniffing you too. Weird, right? <laughs>